Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel? We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you'd care to. We're going to pick it up today in this beautiful uh, book of Psalms, uh, chapter Psalm 69, uh, verse 17. Uh, Psalm 69, known as one of the Passion Psalms, uh, one of the three Psalms having to do uh, with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Uh, of course, we had Psalm 22, uh, unforgettable psalm written a thousand years before Christ was crucified and, and, and tells us of those events even down to the Roman soldiers gambling for uh, his clothing as he died on the cross for our sins. Psalm 40, uh, also one of the Passion Psalms, and of course this, Psalm 69. Uh, in Psalm 22, uh, we saw Christ as a type for the sin offering. Uh, did he have any sin? Absolutely not. Uh, he died for our sins. He took our sins on his back and, and, and bare them for us. In Psalm 40, we see him as a Christ as a type for the whole burnt offering. And here in Psalm 69, a type, if you will, for the trespass offering. Again, did he have any trespasses? No, but he took our trespasses upon himself. So let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears, uh, keeping in mind the events leading up to the crucifixion of Christ. We pick it up today, uh, Psalm 69, verse 17, and it reads, And hide not thy face from thy servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Hear, in other words, in Hebrew, to to make haste to hear me. Hurry, in other words, to hear me uh, and to answer uh, in in his supplication or his prayer. We're going to see a lot toward the end of this psalm uh, concerning God's election and the day of trouble uh, we could carry forward to a future day, uh, the day of Jacob's trouble, uh, that meaning when Antichrist is here on earth. He is going to trouble, the Antichrist is going to trouble uh, the Israel, the descendants of Jacob. When you hear the name Jacob, you should automatically think of all 12 tribes, not just the ten northern tribes or, or Judah. Verse 18, Draw nigh unto my soul and redeem it. Here we see the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, waiting for deliverance. Deliver me because of mine enemies. And, uh, you know, here we have this redeem. We've had that word a lot, redeem and redemption, throughout the book of Psalms. Normally, the word is from the Hebrew word pada, which means to redeem by power. This, however, is in the Hebrew, check it out yourself, is gaal. And it means to redeem from charge by payment. In other words, when Christ was crucified, on the cross, uh, he paid the price in full. Uh, no more does God want sin offerings, burnt offerings, or trespass offerings. Uh, he, Christ, became the sacrifice for one and all times. Salvation, uh, the price has been paid in full with his blood on the cross. Verse 19, Thou hast known my reproach, and my shame, reproach, you can think of as uh, those who mocked me or slandered me. And my dishonor, mine adversaries are all before thee. And in that book of life, they will pay, the adversaries of Christ will be judged for their actions, their works, 
just like the rest of us will be judged for our works. Yes, he did that reproach and that shame and that dishonor. Did he deserve any of it? Of course not. He was completely innocent, but he 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 did that for us. And you know, God's election, uh, as we come to that day of Jacob's trouble, you're going to be reproached if you are one of his election. And I want you to be mentally and spiritually prepared for that. Uh, reproach is not a fun thing, uh, but you should expect it. You know, and, and I guarantee you, it's going to seem like you know when you're talking seven thousand to start with, uh, that number grows to a hundred and forty-four thousand of God's election compared to the population on Earth at that time. Uh, it's going to seem like the entire world is going the other direction from the direction that you are expected to go. And you're going to bear reproach for it. Uh, Be prepared. Verse 20. Reproach hath broken my heart. Again, reproach hurts, uh, uh, especially from those that you love and respect, uh, friends, if you will. And I am full of heaviness, and I looked for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. And this, of course, uh, it made me think about Christ as he went it alone uh, in, through the events leading up to that crucifixion. Even Peter, uh, Peter, who was so bold that he sliced the ear off of one of those who came when Christ was betrayed, when they came to to fetch Christ uh, to deliver him up to the Romans, uh, Peter took his sword and sliced off one of the ears of those who came against Christ. But Christ told even Peter that before the cock crows in the morning, you will betray me thrice, three times. And indeed, that uh, that prophecy of Christ came to pass. Reproach hath broken my heart. And again, uh, you election be prepared for that reproach. But, you know, to to deny Christ at that point, to deny the Holy Spirit, is the unforgivable sin. So I want you to keep in mind what's a little bit of reproach uh, compared to my eternal life, because that's what it could uh, cost one of God's elect. If you let that uh, reproach distract you, if you let the reproach take your eye off of the focus, off the ball, if you will, there's a chance that you'll commit the unforgivable sin. Don't allow that to happen. A little bit of reproach, no problem. I can take it. I'm going to stand and and fulfill my destiny in witnessing against the Antichrist. But again, remember, don't premeditate what you are to say. This, for comforters, but I found none. Not uh, David, if he sought... Uh, This was applicable is what I'm trying to get to to David's time. But you know what? In John chapter 14, Christ promised that, you know, when in preparing the uh, disciples, he said, you know, I'm going to leave you for a while, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. Uh, I'm going to pray and God will send the Holy Spirit. That's God's spirit to comfort you. And that Uh, spirit of God is there for you to call upon. Uh, David couldn't call upon that comfort. Uh, You can is my point. Verse 21, they gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. The scripture quoted in every single one of the gospels, Matthew chapter 27 verse 34 John chapter 19, verse 24, Mark chapter 15, verse 23, Luke chapter 23, verse 36. Uh, This particular Psalm 69, uh, outdone only by Psalm 22 in the number of times that it's quoted in the New Testament. The gall uh, is the poppy, uh, a derivative of the poppy plant. In other words, we're talking about dope 
are drugs. And it's written in the New Testament that when he thirsted as on the cross, uh, they tried to give him vinegar uh, mingled with gall, in other words, poppy. And many of the higher critics say, well, yeah, he was on a high there on the cross. He didn't really feel a thing because he was so doped up on the gall. Well, Christ refused the gall, and then finally they offered him some vinegar without the gall, and he did take that. By the way, the vinegar, not vinegar as we would think of vinegar that uh, you would utilize from your grocery store today. Uh, the vinegar was a, a cheap or a poor man's wine, if you will. The, the soldiers often drank uh, what was called vinegar, which was a, a cheap form of wine, alcohol in other words, 22. Let their table become a snare before them. In other words, let their uh, material possessions and prosperity become a snare. And that which would have been for their welfare, and that being Jesus Christ, let it become a trap. Uh, well, how could Jesus, that was to be for their welfare, their good, uh, how could that become a trap? Well, it's written in the book of Isaiah that he would be uh, the a stump become a stumbling block to many. And how can Jesus be a stumbling block? Well, you see, when the Antichrist returns, many are going to believe that his claims that he is Jesus Christ. And, and when Christ returns and they realize that they've worshipped the fake uh, Christ, the spurious Messiah, which means the instead of Jesus, as Antichrist means, uh, they're going to wish for mountains to fall upon them. Uh, they, it will be a stumbling block to them. Verse 23, Let their eyes be darkened that they see not. Let them become spiritually blind and make their loins continually to shake. This means to shake in fear. This is quoted in Romans uh, chapter 11 verses 9 and 10. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not. Uh, many today have their eyes darkened that they see not. They, they are spiritually blind. 24. Pour out thine indignation upon them, and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. And that cup of wrath is, is Christ pay, uh, prayed on Gethsemane that isn't there any way that this cup can pass and many say well he was having a moment of weakness and he was praying that there would be some other way than that he would be crucified on the cross that isn't what Christ was praying for at all he was praying that when he returns at the second advent that hopefully the Lord would listen to his prayer and there would be some other way than for him to pour out Christ himself as King of kings and Lord of lords to pour out that cup of God's wrath on the wicked evil doers. But that cup will be poured out. 25. Let their habitation be desolate and let none dwell in their tents. This quoted in Acts uh, chapter 1 verse 20 in reference to uh, Judas Iscariot when he uh, fell headlong in his bowels, his insides gushed out. And it goes on to say there that he lost his bishop's rick. Uh, then the other disciples, they had uh, one named Matthias and one named Justice, I believe, was the other one. And they drew lots uh, as to who would replace uh, Judas after he met his unfortunate death or timely death untimely as some might call it but Matthias uh, was selected to replace Judas Iscariot as one of the 12 uh, governmental perfection in, in the number 12 check out this word desolate here uh, the habitation be desolate excuse me uh, that habitation is the word I want you to check out and, and it's a palace 
uh, as surrounded by a wall. And I think that's definitely referring to Jerusalem. And there will be a time when Jerusalem is desolate. Uh, Christ taught of it in Matthew uh, chapter 24. And when he said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where it or he ought not uh, get out of, flee to the mountains. In other words, get out of Jerusalem. And, of course, Daniel uh, foretold of that when the desolator uh, would be in Jerusalem. Verse 26 for they persecute him whom thou hast smitten. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4, uh, it states, We did esteem him, referring to Christ, as stricken. In other words, we looked upon him as stricken by the Lord. And that verse continues on, smitten of God and afflicted. It goes on to say that they hated him for benefits, which they owed him thanks. He did nothing but good works. And uh, what did they do? They crucified him. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4. Uh, might make a side study of it. And they talked to the grief or the pain or affliction of those whom thou hast wounded, uh, the wound, thy wounded ones, in other words. In other words, this would be like those who suffered uh, as a witness. I think God's election can expect to suffer uh, somewhat in the, the pain and the affliction of the enemies as well. Verse 27, add iniquity unto their iniquity. In other words, let their sins or their, their evil, wicked ways uh, pile up upon them to accumulate and also the corresponding uh, chastisement or punishment accumulate for they deserve it and let them not come into thy righteousness and they won't be fit and don't anyone though get off on a guilt trip we're not talking about those who occasionally sin. That's not what the, the subject is here. We're talking about those that if you walked up to them on the street and you tried to engage them in a conversation uh, concerning the Lord and how good He is to us, uh, they don't have time for God. They, they, would, they would laugh you to scorn because uh, they really don't even believe in God. So uh, that's the kind of people we're talking about here. People who just flat don't care about our Heavenly Father. They indeed will not be allowed to come into His righteousness. They don't deserve it. They aren't fit. Verse 28. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written uh, with the righteous. And in Exodus chapter 32, verse 33 we see this book of life first mentioned and Moses mentions it and he said you know Lord if, if, if you want to wipe this people out just wipe me my name Moses out of the book of, of life as well I think it's just referred to as the book there and the Lord said I'll, I'll blot those who sin against me out of the book of life you can also read of this book in many other places, the book of the living. And, of course, when we say living, we're talking about eternal life. Uh, those who are there, the books will be opened at the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20. And we'll all be judged by our works. And some folks have got a lot of wicked, evil things that they've done in their life written by their name. They're going to be judged accordingly. The book you want to make sure your name is written in, however, is the book of life. Uh, those listed there are the ones who have eternal life, my friend. Uh, you want to make sure you're in that book. You might work toward it uh, today. You can work toward it today. 29, but I am poor or afflicted and sorrowful 
Let thy salvation, O God, set me up on high in this uh, poor and sorrowful, constantly utilized in the Psalms in reference to uh, Jesus Christ. But he was set up on high when he paid that price on the cross. Uh, What happened immediately? He ascended to the right hand of God. So, yes, he was set up on high, and that is his rightful place. Verse 30. I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. In other words, in uh, thanks for the salvation offered. And there is only one way. Throughout the Psalms, we notice that when sufferings are discussed that always uh, never mention the sufferings are never mentioned uh, without praise following verse 31 this in italics probably better said praise also shall please the lord better than an ox or bullock that hath horns and hoofs and he doesn't want your burnt offerings being the point. He'd rather have your love, your praise uh, for him, for you to worship him, in other words. Now this having horns and hooves uh, fulfilling part of the requirements of the law is what this is doing in Genesis chapter 15, verse 9. A sacrifice was not to be made that was less than three years old. In other words, Uh, Those of you who aren't familiar with uh, horticulture or agriculture, better stated, uh, an ox or a bullock would not have, or a cow would not have horns until after they were three years old. So that meeting that requirement of the law. The hooves here, check it out in the Hebrew, is paras. And it means, literally, it means to split. In other words, a divided hoof, which is one of the qualifications for uh, an animal to be clean to eat and also acceptable for sacrifice. It would be an abomination to God for someone to offer an, an unclean animal such as a swine that does not uh, split the hoof. Verse 32 Of course, it would be an abomination to uh, sacrifice any kind of animal now to God in this dispensation of time now that Christ has paid the price on the cross. Let me add, verse 32, The humble shall see this and be glad. The humble are uh, those who are meek, if you will. And your heart shall live that seek God. Uh, Underline that. Your heart shall live that seek God. Now, that doesn't say everyone is going to live. There's a qualification. There's a condition in that verse. Did you catch it? Those that seek God. As David would tell his son Solomon as he was preparing him to take over the reign of Israel, he told Solomon in First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9, if you will seek the Lord, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. The heart here, by the way, put for the whole being as well. And, of course, we're talking about live eternally. Verse 33, For the Lord heareth the poor and despiseth not his prisoners. The poor here are the helpless, those uh, which are bound to him, in other words, are the prisoners here. That's it's language similar to what Paul uh, would utilize in Ephesians uh, chapter 3, verse 1, where Paul wrote, I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And, the, you know, it's it's not good to be a prisoner in some cases, but it is good to be a prisoner of Jesus Christ. In other words, to be bound to him to the point that you would say, I am a prisoner to him. Verse 34, let the heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moveth therein, every creeping thing and all of 
creation. And I couldn't think, help but think about it in the New Testament where it's written that, that all of nature groans for the return of Christ at the second advent. Uh, things are going to be set right. Uh, today, it seems that everyone wants to turn things upside down. They want to make what is wrong right and what is right wrong. It is going to be straightened out. It is going to be straightened out when Christ returns as King of kings and Lord of lords. I say, come, Lord Jesus, come. 35. For God will save Zion and will build the cities of Judah that they may dwell there and have it in possession. And as it's written in Acts chapter 2 verse 30 that, that David was a prophet. And here we see some prophecy of David. God will save Zion. That's still future to this point in time. Why would Zion need to be saved? Well, when the Antichrist is there and sets up shop on the north side of Jerusalem, Jerusalem is going to be filthy. It's going to need to be cleansed. And, you know, God's told the people of Israel at one point in time, I'm, this is the last time I'm going to cleanse the temple until the final time I cleanse it. And if you want it cleansed before then, cleanse it yourself. But when Christ was talking to his disciples in Matthew chapter 24, they said, what's it going to be like when, when you return? And he said, you see these buildings? You see these walls? There's not one stone going to be left standing atop another. Well, does that mean there's going to be a nuclear strike on Jerusalem? No, it doesn't. It means that the Lord is going to save Zion. He will tear it completely down, cleanse it, and rebuild it, as David has prophesied in this verse 35. And, you know, have it for a possession. Uh, who is going to have it for a possession? Well, number one, the Zadok. Those are God's election. Uh, you have a very special uh, reward in store for you. Uh, you can read about it in Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 26, in the following verses. God said to the Zadok, to the people, you do not give an inheritance in the land to the Zadok, the priest that reigned with Christ a thousand years. That's the election of Revelation chapter 20, verses 5, 4, 5, and 6. They, they have another reward. That is, they participate in the first resurrection. And I didn't complete that in Ezekiel 44, 26. God said, don't give them an inheritance in the land, for I, God speaking, am their inheritance. What better inheritance or possession could you ask for than to be with Christ in the millennial temple? 36. The seed also of his servants, that's the Zadok, the elect, shall inherit it, and they that love his name shall dwell therein. What a glorious reward. But uh, there are conditions to uh, cash in, if I can use that phrase, on those rewards. Uh, one, you cannot worship the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. Those who uh, overcome, that don't uh, take the mark of the beast. That is required. But what a beautiful promise and reward uh, from our Heavenly Father. And in that Passion Psalm, uh, psalm the, the crucifixion of Christ, uh, quoted in the New Testament only uh, to be outdone by Psalm 22. But Jesus did take the stripes that we receive the healing. But even uh, as he suffered on the cross, he was teaching us of the victory. And these last several verses have been talking about the victory. Uh, Zion uh, cleansed, uh, reclaimed, if you will, rebuilt and the Zadok receiving their just inheritance, uh, taking part in the first resurrection uh, that 
my friend, meaning eternal life. What a reward. Uh, subscription to the chief musician, those of you with companion Bibles, uh, to he who has the victory, to he who gives the victory, and uh, how appropriate in that victory has been our uh, subject or the, the main line of thought over the last several verses there uh, with the Father's help. Psalm 70, Israel's Redeemer uh, awaits uh, deliverance himself, uh, continued. Uh, and by the way, this a psalm of David in the title to bring to remembrance. Now that's not added by man, that's part of God's Word. Well, what does that mean then? What, what is it that we're supposed to bring to our remembrance? Uh, what is written in Psalm 40, verses 13 through 17, which is prophecy of Messiah speaking to our Father. And it's word for word of what we're going to see over the next uh, three or four verses. Psalm 70, verse 1, let's go with it. Make haste, or, or be pleased, you could even translate this, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, and just as Psalm 40, that passion psalm, uh, within it we found these same words. I think that's the reason that we see these same words at the beginning of Psalm 70, immediately following the passion psalm of 69. Verse 2, Let them be ashamed and confounded that seek after my soul. Let them be turned backward and put to confusion that desire my hurt, those who would be pleased with my hurt. Verse 3, let them be turned back for a reward or compensation of their shame that say, aha, aha, uh, this is they would say of Christ back in uh, Psalm, uh, an earlier psalm, aha, aha, now we have what we need to crucify him. This word aha, aha in the Hebrew is heach, heach. And it's said in a very mocking term. You know, they're going to be saying heach, heach uh, toward God's election as well. Verse 4, let all those that seek thee, who seek God, rejoice and be glad in thee. And let such as love thy salvation say continually, let God be magnified. Always magnify our Father, not yourself. You know, we as humans have a tendency when things go well to forget about God. We say, look what I accomplished with my two hands. But then when things go south, things go bad, uh, we're quick to run to God and say, Oh, Lord, why did you let this happen to me? Don't be that way. Verse 5 to conclude Psalm 70. But I am poor or oppressed and needy. Make haste unto me, O God. Thou art my help and my deliverer. O Lord, make no tarrying. Uh, remember me, Lord, in other words. And uh, there we hear the words of the Redeemer, Christ, uh, to his heavenly Father. Uh, we come back and pick up a very interesting psalm in Psalm 71. Uh, I believe, along with many others, that it was written by someone that you're not going to hear of very much in the psalms, uh, the prophet Jeremiah. Don't miss it. We'll come back in our next lecture. We have a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting light in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. 
The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, uh, the United States, and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, feel free to call that 800 number and leave your question. I say possibly answered on the air because, you know, this program goes into millions of homes around the world. This is the only format for answering questions is right here on the air by one of the pastors. We simply don't have uh, the time or staff to give everyone that would like a written response to their question. Uh, if, and if we can't do it for all, we're not going to do it for any. If you're watching by short, or listening by shortwave radio or studying via the Internet somewhere around the world that can't use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. Got a prayer request? We can do away with the telephone number. You don't need a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24-7. I encourage you to make time to talk to Him each day. Let Him know that you love Him. Thank Him for the many blessings that He bestows upon you that we all tend to take for granted. Uh, don't take anything that he does for you for granted. Let him know you love him and, and praise him. That's what he wants from you. doesn't want our burnt offerings. He wants our love. He wants us to worship him. And we do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, we ask you to look upon these. You know their needs, illnesses in families, Father. Uh, many that have uh, troubled marriages, Father, you know their needs. If it is your will, a special blessing on each of these, Father. We also lift up our military troops who are still in harm's way around the world, Father. Watch over, guide, protect, touch, heal in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions. See what's on the mind of folks around the country. First up today, I've got Leon in Louisiana. When did the letters J and V come into existence? When well, Leon, uh, depends on what language we're talking about. And I think what you're talking about is you have heard us say here on the program that there is not an equivalent in the Hebrew language to the English letter J. In other words, there's not a letter in the Hebrew with a J sound. And what it should be, as far as the sacred name is concerned, would be why and it's locked in manuscripts. It's not somebody's guess. It's in the acrostics four or five times in the book of Esther. We're going to run into one time in the book of Psalms as we work our way through the Psalms. But uh, our, our Heavenly Father's sacred name does not start with a J. It is Y-H-V-H, -H, uh, which is pronounced Yahweh. Teresa in Florida. So, if good and bad figs were set out in 1948, does that mean Satan will be here in 2018? Not necessarily. And I know you're referring to the fig tree generation that Christ spoke of in Matthew uh, chapter 34, verses 32 through 34, which state, This generation shall not pass, the words of Christ. And you're right, the, the, the shoot was set out in 1948. But you see, there are three different lengths of generations listed in God's Word. First, we have a 40-year generation. Uh, that came and passed in 19... Uh, uh, what was it, 1988. Uh, and then in um, the 70-year generation will, will come to pass in 2018, and then the 120-year generation in 2068. But keep in mind, too, that we're to know the season 
but no man knows the hour or the exact year. One thing you can be assured of is that this generation shall not pass. How can I be so positive of that? Because Jesus said it himself in Matthew chapter 24. Gilberto in Wisconsin. I understand we are not supposed to talk to the dead as through a medium. Uh, If the so-called dead are dead, where are they at? And why aren't they in heaven? Is there a reason why they haven't moved on while in spirit? Or what are they? Please help me understand where they are and why. Well, the, if someone is dead, uh, the flesh returns to the earth from which it came. Uh, Gilberto and the spirit returns to our Heavenly Father. Now, there are spirits uh, that are evil spirits. They're satanic. They're of Satan. But most of these mediums, uh, uh, they call it entertainment or whatever, but it's evil. It is wicked. And they're not trying to talk with evil spirits. Uh, they have the, uh, for example, if a man had lost his wife, uh, they'll be talking to the man and say, okay, your wife who is dead and with God, is now talking to me. And here's what she has to say. And you stay away from all of that. That's uh, God considers that very, very wicked. Anyone who tries to bring up the dead, as Saul did through the witch of Ender, uh, is not in good standing with our Heavenly Father. You can be assured of that. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, with Saul, the first man king of Israel. Joan in Minnesota. I'm an old-time student with you for many years. You have helped me a lot with the studies and the question time. I learn a lot from the questions also. Uh, Question, if one was baptized uh, at two or three weeks old with the sprinkling method, Does one need to be baptized again by submersion? I really hate to put on a bathing suit at 85 years old, but if that's what it takes, so be it. Well, I respect your willingness to do whatever it takes, Joan. But And to answer your question, I don't believe baptism in any form is required for salvation. John chapter 3, verse 16, doesn't say anything about salvation. Most people who uh, think that you have to be baptized are pointing to John chapter 3, verse 5, I believe it is, where it says that you must be born of water. And they take that to mean baptism. To me, born of water means born of woman. Uh, Irregardless, Christ was baptized He is our example. And if I had been, and I'm giving you my personal opinion, which I don't like to bring into it, but I'm going to give it to you. If I had been sprinkled at the age of two or three weeks, I would consider it important to follow the example of Christ and be uh, baptized by total submersion. Now, having said all that, uh, Joan, it's really not necessary that you wear Uh, a bathing suit or swimsuit to be baptized. Many people uh, wear a a robe or a gown uh, to be baptized. It's just whatever you're comfortable wearing, not uh, anything that is required. JT from Minnesota, I've got a question for you. I was asking about Cain who committed the first murder. And John chapter 8, verse 44 will document that along with the book of Genesis. And my mother said that he also, Satan's son, oh, said that he, Cain, is Satan's son. And listen to your mother. She's right. Uh, is this true? Yes, it is. is. If it is, why would Eve go to the devil again after the first sin. Well, 
Uh, again, your mother's right about Cain being the son of the serpent and Eve. Uh, that's what happened in the Garden of Eden. But Eve did not go back to the serpent. Uh, the first time she was with the serpent, the result was a conception. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 will document that. God told Eve, I'll greatly multiply thy conception. So uh, she conceived after she was with the serpent. The result was her firstborn, Cain. Limley in Virginia. Question, did the six-day creation live up to over 900 years like the eighth-day creation? Yes, I believe that the first generation of the six-day generation probably lived uh, close to 2,000 years because what, what was the thing that caused death? It was disobeying God's commandment. In uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, the first commandment of God, He told Adam and Eve that of all the trees in the garden, you can partake of them. But of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, uh, in the day you partake of it, you will surely die. One day with the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. Methuselah lived to be 969 years old. In the day he was born, he died. In other words, within a thousand years. But no sin. Sin is death. And if there's no commandment, though, there is no sin. And that's why I say the six-day creation, which were created before Eth Ha'adam in Genesis chapter 2, uh, there was no commandment given to them. So I don't think there was any death until after commandments were given by God. Michael in New Mexico. The nations are, are said will be ruled with an iron rod. Um, this means there will still be flesh still being born. Could you please explain about how we will interact with flesh since we have been changed to spirit? How will our loved ones... Uh, that goes into something else here. Let me answer your first question. You're confused because when Christ returns all go into spirit bodies. I don't know who you're talking about here are still being born or in the flesh. Uh, the nations that you're referring to in Revelation chapter 19, verse 15, which is where Michael is pulling this scripture from, are in spirit as well. But the rod of Christ, and I think what you're saying is that they would have to be in flesh for the rod of Christ to be uh, harmful or chastising to them. Uh, when Christ returns as King of kings and Lord of lords, that rod, his scepter, if you will, the king's scepter, uh, he can chastise those who are in spiritual bodies. It's, it's not uh, just used on those who are in the flesh. In fact, at that point, flesh will be no longer. Troy in Ohio, Revelation 8 at the seventh seal, silence is in heaven uh, for half an hour. Since five months, earth time is one hour in heaven. Would that be two and a half months here on earth? You've got it. Uh, if so, might this be when the Lord returns since the seals, trumps, and seven bowls, I guess you mean vials, all line up as one or do they not? Yes, they all line up. Jesus returns at the seventh trump, the seventh vial, the seventh seal. The Antichrist here as at the sixth trump, sixth vial, and sixth seal, 666. That's his number. Uh, those who count can count know that Antichrist in the sixth trump comes before Christ in the seventh. Don't be deceived. Timothy in California where can I find the genealogy of Cain? You'll find it in Genesis chapter 4, and it is quite different than the genealogy of Adam, which you'll find in Genesis chapter 5. Why? Because Cain was not Adam's son. Aaron, and I don't know where Aaron's from, where is it in the Bible 
that shows women can preach. Please give scripture. Well, be happy to. Uh, Miriam, the sister of Moses and Aaron, was a prophetess. Do you know what a prophetess or a prophet is? A prophet or a prophetess is someone that speaks the word of God. And there is no more powerful form of preaching than uh, speaking the word of God. You ask for scripture, Exodus chapter 15, verse 20, will document that Miriam, uh, the sister of Moses and Aaron, was a prophetess. Second Kings chapter 22, verse 14, uh, you have another lady there by the name of Huldah. Uh, Huldah worked at a university. And when the king uh, of Israel and uh, the, the high priest of Israel found the law in the temple, go figure, a, a copy of the law in the temple. My goodness, what's, what's this place coming to? They didn't understand it, so they took it to Huldah, and she told them what God's word said. She was a prophetess as well. Uh, you want New Testament? Uh, Philip's four, four daughters were all virgins, Acts chapter 21, verse 9. And they were prophetesses. They prophesied as well. And it will happen in the future as well, Acts chapter 2, verse 17, when that cloven tongue, that language that the Holy Spirit speaks through God's election so that every ear on earth can hear and understand uh, that will be spoken by the sons and daughters of God. Joan in Connecticut were the Canaanites, that's with a C, uh, a Nephilim tribe. Well, they mixed uh, with the Nephilim. In fact, uh, as early as Genesis chapter 12, uh, verse 6, the Canaanite was in the land, it states there. And, and the Canaanite is put for the Nephilim there. That was speaking of the second influx. Uh, you see, they came, the Nephilim are fallen angels. In Genesis 6, uh, they came to earth. They saw the daughters of Adam. They liked what they saw, and they went into them, and giants were born. That was the reason for Noah's flood, was to wipe out that seed line so it would foil Satan's plan to pollute the seed line up to Messiah. Messiah thought, um, excuse me, Satan thought, oh, if I can keep Messiah from coming, then I win. And he would have won if Messiah hadn't come. And then you say, were the Nephilim fallen angels? Yes, of course. Will it be like in the days of Noah? Christ said so in Matthew. Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, and the following verses. It's going to be just like in the days of Noe, N-O-E. Don't let that throw you. N-O-E is the same as Noah, in the, uh, transliterated from the Hebrew language, but translated from the Greek language. It's going to be just like in the days of Genesis chapter 6, when the fallen angels came to earth, saw the daughters of Adam, went into them. Ricky from Oklahoma, some believe once saved, <clears throat> excuse me, always saved. When a person receives salvation through Jesus, gets saved, you have in quotes, and sins and does not repent, can we lose our salvation? And yes, you can. Uh, you're certainly going to be judged on those sins, if not lose uh, your salvation. But yes, you can sin to the point you lose your salvation. I can document that in Luke chapter 12, verses 10 through 13, because it's possible for even God's election to lose their eternal life, their salvation, if you will, if they uh, commit the unforgivable sin, which is to prohibit the Holy Spirit speaking through them when they're delivered up. You follow with a question, too. Uh, is it wrong to go to a church that teaches and believes in the rapture? And should I keep my mouth shut about that in church? Well, I'm not going to tell you where to attend church. Uh, I will give you a scripture, second epistle of John. There's only one chapter, verses 9 and 10 
tells us that if any come to you without this doctrine, meaning the doctrine of Jesus Christ, uh, don't invite them into your home nor wish them Godspeed, which is a salutation like have a nice day. And if you're not supposed to say even have a nice day to someone who doesn't bring the doctrine of Christ, which the rapture theory certainly qualifies for, that's not biblical. Uh, if you support that church through your tithes and offerings, that's worse than, uh, that's a lot more, I should say, than saying have a nice day. As far as keeping your mouth shut about that in church, if you are going to a church uh, that you're a guest at, uh, you should respect uh, what they're saying and doing. Don't be a troublemaker. God does not like those who sow discord among the brethren. Now, as far as planting seeds, that's another story. But when you're attending a church and they have their pastor or their minister there, you respect that and keep your mouth shut because that's not the time for you to, to be differing or offering a different opinion. Uh, if you disagree to that point, uh, you should uh, uh, kick the dust off your feet and go somewhere else is the teaching of Christ. Floyd in Kentucky, who are the two witnesses and what role do they play? Well, you can read about them uh, first in God's Word in Zechariah uh, chapter 4 where they're called the two olive trees. Uh, the last verse they're called uh, the sons of oil. And then in Revelation chapter 11, uh, they are uh, uh, God's anointed ones. I'm out of time. I love you all a great deal because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in depth. You know, it makes your Father's Day when he looks down and, and he sees you with the letter that he wrote to you and you're seeking him. We had that in our lesson today. Seek him and he will be found of you. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. Most important this, beloved, stay in his word every day. Every day in your Father's word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? It's because Jesus Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.